Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnson and welcome to lecture 20 of Introductory Linear Algebra. Today we're going to continue on with learning how to solve systems of linear equations and the key ingredient that we're going to introduce today is something called row echelon form and reduced row echelon form. Okay, so let's get right into it. The idea here is that row echelon form pins down this notion that we talked about in the previous video of a matrix or a linear system being sort of upper triangular, having this form that lets us do back substitution. Okay, so in order for a matrix to have row echelon form, in other words, for a matrix to have this back substitutable form, it has to have two properties, okay? These properties A and B here are what makes something have row echelon form. Okay, so the first thing that it's got to have is that every row consisting entirely of zeros, if there are any rows consisting entirely of zeros, they must be tucked away at the bottom of the matrix, okay? So you can't have a zero row at the top or in the middle or anywhere. It's got to be tucked away at the bottom of the matrix below every non-zero row. Okay, and then the next thing, this is sort of the more important, this is the key property here. In any non-zero row, there is a first non-zero entry, right? Okay, and we're going to call that first non-zero entry the leading entry of that row. Okay, and then what the matrix has to have is that the leading entries, they form sort of a stair-step pattern going down and to the right. Okay, so if you ever have a leading entry, there are no leading entries directly below it or to the left of it. The only other leading entries are below and to the right of it. Okay, that's the only option. That's what gives the matrix sort of this upper triangular form. That's what makes it have row echelon form. Okay, and then there's a slightly stronger, or slightly more restrictive form called reduced row echelon form. We'll come back to that in a moment, okay? For now, I'm going to skip over properties C and D and just focus on properties A and B. Those are what make it have row echelon form. All right, so let's do an example here, okay? The question is, is this matrix in row echelon form? All right, so the first question you got to ask is property A. Does it satisfy property A? Are there are all of the zero rows tucked away at the bottom? And well, this matrix has no zero rows. There's no row that's entirely zeros. So yeah, property A is sort of trivially true. It's fine. Then you look at property B. In every non-zero row, there's a first non-zero entry, the leading entry. Did those form sort of a stair-step pattern down to the bottom right? Is every leading entry below and to the right of the leading entries above it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight the leading entries here. The leading entries are three, one, two, and one. And we're sort of okay with what's going on down here, but there's a problem up here, okay? This leading entry one, it's not to the right of the leading entries above it, it's directly below the leading entry above it, right? We have a leading entry one directly below the leading entry three, and that's not okay. This entry here, tells us that this matrix is not in row echelon form. So this is sort of not a form, like if this represented a linear system, we would not be able to do back substitution from here. Okay, we would have to do some other linear, uh, some other combinations of rows to get us into row echelon form but before we could do back substitution. Okay, another example, what about this matrix here? Is this in row echelon form? Okay, so first check for the zero rows. Are they tucked away at the bottom? And well, there's only one zero row, and yeah, it's tucked away at the bottom, so property A is good. Next thing we gotta check is the leading entries. Okay, well, there's a leading entry here, and a leading entry here, and a leading entry here. And the question is, is every leading entry to the right of any leading entries above it? And yes, that is satisfied this time. Like this leading entry one, well, it's to the right of the leading entry two above it. And this leading entry three, it's to the right of the leading entries one uh, sorry, two and one that are above it. It doesn't have to be immediately to the right. Like the three doesn't have to be in this column over here. It just has to be to the right, anywhere to the right. Okay, just as long as it's not to the left or straight down below. Okay, so yes, because the leading entries form this sort of stair-step pattern going down to the bottom right, yes, this matrix is in row echelon form. Okay, so now I want to go back up and talk about reduced row echelon form, okay? So reduced row echelon form, it's a more restrictive form that sometimes it's nice to go to, okay? And these two extra restrictions are that every leading entry has to be one, okay? So every leading entry in a non-zero row has to equal one, okay? So in other words, these boxes that have, uh, sorry, these numbers I've highlighted in yellow here, these would all have to be one for it to be in reduced row echelon form. That's what property C says. Okay, and then the, the other property, property D, this extra thing that you also need for reduced row echelon form, is that each leading entry, it's gotta be the only non-zero entry in its column. Okay, so for example, I mean, you can see right away that no, this property is also not satisfied by this matrix on the left, because I mean, here's the leading entry, there are lots of other non-zero things in that same column. 
Okay, and similarly with the example on the right here, here's a leading entry, here's a non-zero thing in the same column. Here's a leading entry, here's a non-zero entry in the same column. So no, that matrix on the right, it's in row echelon form, but it's not in reduced row echelon form for all sorts of reasons, right? It's got a leading entry that's not one. It's got a leading entry that's not one. It's got non-zero entries in the same column as a leading entry. For all those reasons, it's not in reduced row echelon form. All right, so let's do one more example, okay? Is this matrix here, is this in reduced row echelon form or in row echelon form or both or neither or what? Okay, so we have those four properties to check, right? Property A, check the zero rows. Are they tucked away at the bottom? Yes, they are, so property A is satisfied. Property B, check the leading entries. Well, one, one, one. Those are my leading entries. Do they form a stair-step pattern going down to the bottom right? Yes, they do. Okay, no leading entry is directly below another leading entry, and no leading entry is below and to the left of a leading entry. Yes, they go down to the right, so property B is satisfied. So I know right away it's at least in row echelon form. Next thing we gotta check, are those leading entries one? One, one, and one. Yes, all leading entries are one, so property C is satisfied. Okay, and then the last thing we gotta check, in every column that has a leading entry, are all of the non-leading entries equal to zero? Here's a leading entry, everything else in that column zero. Here's a leading entry, everything else in that column is zero. Here's a leading entry, everything else in that column is zero. Great, that's property D. Every single one of those properties is satisfied, so yes, this matrix is in reduced row echelon form. And well, every, every matrix that's in reduced row echelon form is automatically in row echelon form. So yeah, it's in row echelon form too. Okay, the fact that it's got all sorts of non-zero weird entries in these two columns does not matter, okay? Those are not leading columns, okay? As long as you have just ones and zeros in these leading columns, then you're good, okay? And sort of the way to think about this is basically like row echelon form. So a matrix like the one on the right this is sort of the form that you can do back substitution with, okay? If you're thinking of this as a linear system, from here you could do back substitution to solve the linear system. Whereas reduced row echelon form, that goes one step farther. You don't even need to do back substitution from here to solve the linear system. You can just read the solution off directly. For example, this row down here, this third row, that tells us that whatever variable this column corresponds to equals five. We know that, hey, if this was like w, x, y, z, then this would tell us one times z equals five. This one would tell us that you know one times y equals minus four. You can just read the solution off right away without even having to do back substitution. All righty, well, let's sort of use these ideas to actually solve a linear system now, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the linear system, represent it as an augmented matrix, we're gonna do row operations on it to put into that upper triangular form, in other words, uh, in other words row echelon form, and then we're gonna do back substitution to actually solve the linear system, okay? So these are just the same ideas that we've done uh, sort of over the last lecture and a half now. Okay, so let's start off with this linear system. Remember what this corresponds to is like one times x plus minus two times y equals minus two, and three times x minus two times y uh, equals six, okay? And so the first thing we wanna do is we wanna, we wanna get in row echelon form, so I wanna get a zero in the bottom left. I wanna get upper triangular, so I'm gonna do row two, minus three row one, right? I'm gonna do three minus three to get a zero down there. And then the other two entries in that row just are what they are. It's minus two uh, plus six becomes four, careful of your double negative, and six plus six becomes 12. Again, careful of your double negative. Okay, and then because this linear system is so small, we're already actually at row echelon form, right? We just sort of highlight things here. Here are my leading entries, uh, stair-step pattern going down to the bottom right. Great, it's in row echelon form. So from here, I can do back substitution to solve this linear system. Okay, so equation two just tells me four y equals 12. I can solve that to get y equals three, just divide both sides by 12. Then I substitute back into the top equation there. And when I do that, I'm gonna get x minus two times three, so minus six equals minus two. And then I can just rearrange that and solve for x. I get x equals four. All right, so that's my solution of the linear system. Okay, x equals four, y equals three. Okay, and that's the unique solution of that linear system. We found only one solution. All right, let's do another example, but this time, this time I'm gonna start off with an example that's in reduced row echelon form. Okay, so this linear system here, right, what this means is one times x plus zero times y equals minus six, and zero times x plus one times y equals five. Okay, that, that matrix here, this augmented matrix is in reduced row echelon form. So like I said earlier, once it's in reduced row echelon form, you can just read off what the solution is. You don't need to do any work anymore. 
Okay, so you can just read off, for example, from the bottom equation, that tells us that 0x plus 1y equals 5. In other words, y equals 5. Okay, top equation tells us 1x plus 0y equals minus 6. In other words, x equals minus 6. So you just read off the solution. You don't need to be clever. You don't even need to do back substitution. Okay, so our approach to solving linear systems is do row operations to get it into row echelon form and then solve via back substitution or do row operations to get all the way into reduced row echelon form and then just read off the solution from the matrix right away. All right, so let's go through one of these. Okay, let's go through this method called Gaussian elimination, which is get in row echelon form and then back substitute. Okay, so let's solve this linear system here. We're gonna make a three by three, so that's not quite so obvious as the two by two example we just did. All right, so first thing we're gonna do, represent it as an augmented matrix, okay? And we've done this, just take the coefficients on the left, that becomes the three by three matrix on the left, and scalars on the right, that becomes the augmented right-hand side. Okay, next thing we're gonna do is we wanna get in row echelon form, so we wanna make it look sort of upper triangular, right? Right now I've got three leading entries in this first column, which doesn't, just won't do. I don't, I don't want leading entries on top of each other. I've gotta zero out these two entries here. Okay, so I'm gonna take row two and subtract two times row one to get a zero here. And then I'm gonna take row three and I'm gonna add row one to get a zero down here. Okay, so that's all that I've written here. Okay, I did row two minus two row one and row three plus row one. Okay, row one's not gonna change. I'm not modifying row one at all, so I just copy that down. In the left column, I get zeros. That's why I did those particular row operations. And then I have to compute what the entries are down here just by doing these row operations. So for example, I get four minus double two. So four minus four is zero. And I get zero, careful of your double negative. It's minus two times minus four is plus eight. And same thing over here, zero plus eight is eight. And then in the bottom row, you just add the top and the bottom row. So I do one plus minus one is zero. That's why I did that row operation. I get two plus one is three. I get minus four plus three is minus one. And I get six plus minus four is two. Okay, next up, I'm happy with my first column because I've got a leading entry here is my one, that's my leading entry. I've got no leading entries below it, that's good. But my next two leading entries are the three and the eight here, and those are sort of in the wrong order, okay? It's not upper triangular. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna swap these two rows here, <clears throat> okay? And when I do that, what happens is now I have, okay, I swapped row two and row three, so here I just swapped row and two and row three. And now, now I'm happy, right? Now I've got this upper triangular form, right? Now my leading entries are the one, three, and eight, and that's in row echelon form. So from here I can do back substitution. Okay, so back substitution, you start off with the bottom equation that says eight times z equals eight. You just solve that, you get z equals one. You substitute that into equation two. I get three minus one now, because I know z is one. So three minus one, sorry, three y minus one equals two. You rearrange and solve for y, you get y equals one as well. And now you substitute both of those uh, values back into the top equation. Top equation says x plus 2y minus 4z equals minus 4. You plug in our values for y and for z into that equation. You get x plus 2 minus 4 equals 4. You move the plus 2 and the minus 4 over to the other, hand, other side, and you find that x equals minus 2. Okay? And then you've got your whole solution. Okay? x, y, z is minus 2, 1, 1. So we're done. Okay, so it's basically the same procedure that we went through last class. We're just sort of pinning down the details a little bit more. Okay, and there are a whole bunch of nice facts about these elementary row operations that we're doing in row echelon form. So the, the only one that I want to dwell on a little bit right now, though, is that row echelon form is very, very not unique. Okay, and what I mean by that is if you start off with some augmented matrix and you do row operations, you could bring it to all sorts of different row echelon forms, right? I mean, for example, in this previous linear system, I did row operations and brought it to this row echelon form. But I mean, if someone else, like some other student in this class did row operations, they might get a very different row echelon form. And that's not because they're doing things wrong, it's just they did a different sequence of row operations and they might still get the same right answer at the end of the day. Okay, so row echelon forms are very, very not unique. And it's not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just a feature of row echelon forms. Sometimes we, we like instead having sort of a unique canonical form that we can bring a matrix to via these row operations, okay? And that's reduced row echelon form, okay? That's one of the nice features about reduced row echelon form. It actually is unique, okay? And that's sort of the point, okay? It answers the question of how simple can you make a matrix via these row operations? What is the simplest possible form that you can bring it down to? Well, you can go farther than just row echelon form. You can go all the way to reduced row echelon form. And if you do go all the way to reduce row echelon form, 
That's a procedure called Gauss-Jordan elimination, okay? Gaussian elimination was you solve a linear system by getting to row echelon form and then back substituting, whereas Gauss-Jordan elimination is you solve the linear system by going all the way to reduced row echelon form and then just reading off the solution. All right, so let's see how that works. Let's see how it differs. Okay, let's use Gauss-Jordan elimination to solve the same linear system that we just solved, but we solved it with Gaussian elimination earlier. All right, so your starting point is the same. The, the starting point, the start of your calculation is the exact same. First, you represent it in an augmented matrix, just like we did before. This is the same augmented matrix from the previous example. And then you do the same sequence of row operations, right? All that, we, all that I'm doing here is I'm sort of saying, hey, do the same row operations that we did before to get into row echelon form, okay? So I just copied down the row echelon form that we computed up here. Okay, so that part of the computation is still the same. But now, instead of doing back substitution, I'm going to go farther. I'm going to do row operations to get this into reduced row echelon form. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say, ah, I've got a leading entry of three and a leading entry of eight. I don't like those. Okay, I want all my leading entries to be one because I'm going to reduce row echelon form. Fortunately, that's an easy fix to make. Just multiply the second row by a third, multiply the third row by an eighth. Okay, so that's all I'm doing here. And this is the result of that computation. Okay, great. Now the leading entries are correct. That's property C of reduced row echelon forms. Okay, the last thing I need to do is I need to get zeros everywhere in a column that has a, a leading entry. So first column's already good. Leading entry, zeros elsewhere in that column. Second column's not quite good. I've got a zero down here, but I want a zero up there. And third column's not good at all. I've got a leading entry here. I need zeros above it. Okay, so the way that I'm going to get zeros in that entire upper triangular portion is I'm going to work right to left. Okay, I'm going to start with my third column, get zeros above it, okay? All right, so I'm going to take multiples of row three and add them to the second, first and second rows. That's what I'm doing here. Because when I take multiples of row three, I'm not going to screw up anything over in, in this left-hand side uh, of, the, of the matrix, right? I'm just going to alter stuff over here. I'm going to get my zeros up there. Okay, so if I do row one plus four times this row down here, then I'll get a zero up here. And if I do row two plus a third of this row down here, then I'll get a zero in this entry, which is what I want. That's why I'm doing that row operation, okay? You have to recompute this right-hand side though, because that does change, right? I'm also gonna get minus four plus four is zero in the top right. I'm gonna get two thirds plus one third in the right middle, so I'm gonna get one over there. All right, and I'm almost done. I'm not quite there though. Still, I'm not happy with this top, this two in the top middle entry there because that's a two above a leading entry. And property D of reduced row echelon form says, no, I need zeros everywhere else in that column. All right, so I'm just gonna do row one minus double row two. Okay, and I'll zero out this entry without screwing up any of the other entries that I care about. All right, so row one minus two row two. Okay, that'll get me a zero there. That's why I did it. And be careful, you have to recompute this entry as well because that one turns into a minus two now. It's zero minus two. And now this, this is reduced row echelon form, right? Here's a leading entry, here's a leading entry, here's a leading entry. They're all ones, they got zeros above and below them. Great, reduced row echelon form. I can just read off the solution, right? This top equation, what this means is one times x plus zero y plus zero z equals minus two. In other words, x equals minus two. Similarly, the second equation, the second row, that says y equals one. Third row, that's an equation that says z equals one. So our solution is just minus two, one, one. And of course, it's the same solution that we found via Gaussian elimination, but I mean, it's kind of nice because we can just read off the solution from the right. We don't have to do back substitution. Alrighty, so neither of these methods is better than each other, okay? Like the question is Gaussian elimination or Gauss-Jordan elimination better? That's a nonsensical question. Neither of them is better than each other. Oftentimes it just comes down to personal preference, which one you use, okay? Do you wanna do the back substitution step or do you wanna do extra row operations to be able to just read off the solution? Most of the time it doesn't matter. You can do whichever one makes you more comfortable. But one nice feature of Gauss-Jordan elimination is that it gets you all the way to reduce row echelon form, which as I mentioned, is actually unique. So if you like, like you can go all the way to reduce row echelon form and then you can compare your answer to someone else's answer. And if you've done your work properly, you will always have the same answer. Your reduced row echelon forms will be the same, whereas just row echelon forms won't necessarily always be the same. Alrighty, that'll do it for today. Um, next class, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do more of this. We're gonna talk more about how to solve linear systems, except we're gonna look at sort of the weird cases. All of the examples that we've gone through so far, we've had a unique solution. We've gotten down to X, Y, and Z equals some junk. 
What if we're in one of the other two cases though? What if we have no solution or what if we have infinitely many solutions? How do we deal with those two cases? Well, that's next class, so I'll see you then.